Star Drive 117.8 You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay I'm sitting in my ride and it's time to fly So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind Hey guys, how is it going? And welcome to the Morning Star Drive on 117.8 It is Wednesday, November 1st And so happy for you joining us We are ready to start another day together with the Lord So subscribe to us on YouTube Follow us on SoundCloud And make sure to support us on Patreon So today we have an exciting podcast for you. We have Health is Happiness, the Foundational Figures Word Study, and of course, commentaries, updates, and news on what is happening around the world in this history today. All right, everyone, how are you doing? And how has your week been already? It's Wednesday. It is hump day, middle of the week. We have service tonight, so I hope you guys are getting ready for that too. If you haven't yet, go ahead, leave a like and comment below to build our community. Just super happy for everyone joining us every weekday on the Morning Star Drive. So let's get up and support each other each and every day. Uh, This week's Sunday message title, Judgment and Destruction for Satan and the Evil. All right, so it is a good morning, everyone. A great morning. Uh, I hope that... um, yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty wild. It's already Wednesday, but not only is it just Wednesday, it's already November, right? I'm thankful just to be here and what we're doing at this time, but it's already the beginning of November. It's already the first. I'm like, wow, we're into this last month before the, before like the December, the month of judgment comes, right? So I thought, uh, you know, for me, I thought October was going by really fast until I came to Korea. Like these last three days I've been here in Korea, it's been so long. It felt so long. It's like the three days of October were just crazy slow for me. Just a lot of things I was doing, going out, hiking, in what doing, praying, doing all these other different things in the cafe, trying out coffee and stuff like that too. But, you know, I'm pretty sure it's... uh for you guys, it might be pretty normal because I have a change of, change of scenery. I have jet lag and everything else. All, you know, put If I put that all together, it has been kind of rough for me. It really, really has. Not rough as in like uh, it's a bad trip. I love the trip so far. I've been meeting so many good people. I've been... Uh, yeah, it's just... It's been an amazing trip already. Just to, even my two days in Wormington too. So, yeah. You know, Wormington, it's just... Just being in this area is super spiritual. I'm not sure what it is, okay? Because I don't even wake up to my alarm. I just straight up get up. Like today, it was like 3.47 a.m. I went to sleep around 11.30, just got up 3.47 a.m. And, you know, I'm up and getting ready for pre-dawn. And I think this is kind of the, what you call like the jet lag effect. But I had very, very good prayer today. And I would say the interesting thing is, I'm not sure if this means my prayers are deeper but I definitely have better conversations with God. Does that make sense? It's like, I'm not going to that, like not getting to like that type of like prayer, but it's very comfortable. Like I sit there just conversating with God, like, all right, God, this, you know, I don't say that actually. I'm like, God, uh, these are a couple things on my mind. I've been going through this. I've been going, th- oh, and you know what? I had a dream this morning. I had a dream this morning. Very, very interesting dream. So, uh, Uh, I had a dream right before I woke up and, uh, I was at a store buying shoes. Okay. So there's, uh, for me, especially in Korea, finding my, I'm a size 12, uh, which is like size 300 in Korea, but it's, uh, it's a very large size and you can't find many of these sizes. Right. So I was at a store buying shoes and then there's this pair of shoes, my size. I like them. They were these blue shoes. I wanted them. It was the last pair. And the guy says to me, I'll give it to you 50% off. I was like, whoa, this is so awesome. So I tried on the left shoe and then I was like, oh, this is nice. I tried on the left shoe, but the left shoe feels really weird. Uh, the, the right shoe feels really weird. I'm like, whoa, why is it so weird? I looked down and it's a different shoe. So they weren't the same shoe and it was also like, it was also a left-footed shoe. So I'm wearing two left-footed shoes, right? So I'm like, I told the guy like, hey, dude, this is a, uh, this is the wrong shoe. So he looked, and then he's like, oh, I thought it was the right shoe. And then uh, he went and gave me the right shoe, and then I woke up, right? So uh, I'm not sure if this is the same in every culture, but I know in Korea, getting new shoes is a sign, like, symbolizing getting a new mission. So that's why for me, I'm just like, ooh, like, this could be something that I could be getting. However, that dream said that the first shoe, like, I tried the first shoe was okay, but the second shoe, the pair wasn't matching. So... Uh, it wasn't matching and then eventually got the right shoe. So I'm thinking to myself is like, I wonder what that means, right? And it, lo and behold, 
Uh, I had I had uh, I had lunch today uh, with uh, some people from HQ over here. Just really fun, good time having dinner, and then uh, the 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 like, missions came up. It was like about internet ministry, what I can do while I'm here in Korea, and stuff like that too. So. Uh, yeah, I found that very, very interesting. Like on the day I have that dream, I'm already starting to talk about missions. And I do think that, you know, I'm, I'm very cautious right now because in the, in the dream, the first shoe didn't fit. Right. So, you know, it could mean that, you know, this, this mission may not fit me and there might be another opportunity that I'm not actually listening to yet for me to actually just say, okay, I want to take this mission kind of thing like that too. So, uh, very, very interesting. I, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to do this, but, uh, I'm going to let God lead. I'm going to let God lead, but yeah, like I'm in a super spiritual place. I'm getting spiritual dreams, right? I'm not a very big spiritual dream person, but I got that dream and I, it made me think much more deeply about my future too. Right. Also tonight, Tonight, because, you know, I'm, I'm doing this podcast, not late night, because tonight I have like a welcome party. That's kind of cool, huh? And I wouldn't say it's a real welcome party. It's more of we have a reason to eat together. You know what I mean? Like we have a reason to go out and eat together. So I'm like, oh, okay, that's that's probably, you know, and I'm fine with that too. You can, you can, you can use this as an excuse. Have a welcome party for me. Uh, my Japanese friends are coming over to make, uh, we're going to have like a, like an odeng party. Or okono- okonomiyaki party, right? So those of you guys don't know what okonomiyaki is. It's like, uh, you know, I'm probably saying it really in a very Western way. Okonomiyaki. I don't know how to say okonomiyaki. I don't know. My accent's terrible anyways. So it's kind of like a, a Japanese pancake. But in the pancake is like vegetables or meat and seafood and all these different things in it. I've had it many times. For me, the my favorite part about okonomiyaki is... The sauce. There's this brown sauce that's like savory and sweet. And I love that sauce. So I'm not sure what it's called. I'll just call it the brown sauce or the okonomiyaki sauce, whatever it is. So I'm excited about this for sure. So I'll be heading out to go to the to the market to go shopping for uh, some supplies for that party tonight. So I'm really happy about that too. And uh, yeah, like, uh, oh, something really inspiring uh, happened to me today. Like, I was really moved by it. Like, almost to the point I was, like, in, I was tearing up. So, uh, in the morning, uh, what happened was, uh, you know, I, I got to one McDonald's around, like, 8.45. Walked around. I prayed. Uh, I went to new places that I haven't seen before. And uh, then I was like, oh, it's like, uh, let me go check out the, the cafe because it usually it opened at 9 a.m. the other day. I was like, okay. So, I went down, and it was closed. So, I checked the sign, and the sign said, Tuesdays uh, or this uh, Tuesdays open at 10 a.m. So I was like, okay, so I'll come back at 10. So I went around. I went to a, a, this one of the new gazebos. Uh, it's like at the, it's right above the Holy Spirit waterfall. And you get a really, really nice view, right? It's a great view. You see the pond, 316 side profile. You see the ambition masterpiece. Uh, you see the cafe and everything else. It's really, really nice there. And I, I, I prayed there. And then uh, already it was like 10 o'clock. So I went back down to uh, go to uh, the cafe, all right? On the way to the cafe. So I got to just tell you one thing. I'm going to be super honest about something because, you know, I don't know the full situation in Korea. I don't know what people are thinking, what, what's on people's minds and stuff like that too. So uh, I just try my best to not make eye contact with people. And, uh, you know, so I had my sunglasses on, my hat on, and I'm just kind of walking down. I just don't. I just don't want to greet people, right? I, I just want to meet people, kind of thing, right? And uh, I, uh, as I'm going down, there's also someone else there who's kind of crossing my path. And of course, I don't want to, like, you know, I'm just gonna do the regular like greeting and stuff like that and keep moving forward. But as I got close, remember, I'm wearing sunglasses, so I can look at this person a little bit longer. And as I looked at this person more closely, this person was walking in yellow. I was like, oh, I, 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 I know her. So I, I kind of glanced at them. I took off my sunglasses and um, this is someone I used to run with a lot and someone I actually was quite worried about before in March and I actually contacted them, right? And uh, right when we walked into each other, we're like, what? Huh? And then, you know, she looked at me like, oh, wow. Oh, I was trying to figure out if you how, how you were doing too. And I even, like I said, I contacted them in March just to see how things were going. And uh, this person, when I contacted them, they didn't respond. But this person was almost in tears too, just so happy to see that I was doing okay. I just so happy. 
And this person, the first thing they brought up was the text that I gave them during that time in March. And uh, they said, like, they were telling me, like, oh, I got your text, I got your call, but I, I, I didn't, I didn't answer it because, you no, know, and I understood because the situation was so crazy. Uh, this person had no idea what side I was on, what I was going to say to her, whatever it was. But I did call, and when when this person saw me, they were uh, genuinely happy that I was alive. And for me, it was so moving that this person was that caring uh, to just to know that I was doing okay. And uh, it it made me so thankful uh, to be in this history and having people here that we've run together with that really care about each other. Like, you know, for me, I was like, wow, this person, like they're they're in tears and so happy to meet and for me too, because it's someone I ran with in the past, you know, it was it was really inspiring for me. And uh, you know, you know what kind of reminds me of the feeling is, you know, when you watch those like World War II movies or movies about war, and there's a big battle and people get separated. No one knows where anyone else is. Bombs are exploding and all these other different things are happening. And after the battle is done, after the bombs are all dropped and people are all scattered, everyone gathers again into like the town center. And, you know, at, only after all the destruction is done, people start to gather again and they're kind of looking for the survivors. Are the, do the people I love, are they still there? And when they see, like, you know, all these people are greeting and, and hugging each other and you're still looking and looking and all of a sudden you see, like, your child or you see your sister or whatever it is and you run and you hug them, you can't believe that they're still, like, that's, that's the kind of feeling it was. Right. I don't know. Maybe maybe I watched too many movies. Right. But it was that feeling. It's like, you know, like, you know, you have your sister like you're like, uh, well, my, if I had a I don't have a sister. I need a I need a name for a sister. Let's just say. Uh, um, what's that? What's that? What's that? What's give me any name, guys? Come on. Just name some names. All right. I'll use that game. I'll, Rhonda. Let's just say Rhonda. OK. And, you know, be, you know, like the bombs have all dropped. Everyone's gathering back. And you're like, Rhonda, Rhonda. Rhonda! And then it's like, oh, and you you look and the crowd starts to to open up and then you see your sister. And you're like, oh, and then she turns and looks at you and your eyes lock. And you're like, oh, Rhonda. And you like hug and you're like so happy to see each other. There's tears of joy, right? Like that's the kind of feeling I had is like, yeah, it was so, it was really amazing. And people went through a lot, right? And I would say that uh, those of us in the foreign countries, we probably don't know how crazy it really got, like here in Korea. And I could feel it from meeting this person and they were like tearing up. And for me, I was really moved by it too because I was like, wow, they, I cannot understand exactly what everyone went through at this time. I just can't. And uh, just to meet an old friend that's still here, but someone who's very, very close to KJS and stuff like that too, but didn't go to that side. Uh, I was I was really moved and inspired too by that too. So, But you know, there's a funny thing that I thought about though, because after like meeting this person, I went to the cafe and uh, if I'm going to be honest with you guys, I didn't remember contacting them. Like it, they, they brought it up first. They brought it up. I was like, oh yeah, I did contact this person kind of thing. Right. So, um, so, uh, I, I you know, I, I didn't remember that. I, 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 they brought it up first. Like, oh, you, you, you called me and I, and I, and they were explaining to me the situation, but they were so thankful that I actually checked up on them. Right. And I thought to myself as like, wow, you know, girls really remember things much better than guys. Like they really, really do. Like, of course, it could be like every small thing is remembered. All these gestures of like love or caring, they're all remembered, which can sometimes be a bad thing, too, if they remember, you know, everything. But in this case, it was really, really good. So I was like, wow, like, uh, you know, I was like, wow, girls really remember everything. Right. I'm like, man, you got to You got to treat people well because they'll remember every little thing so yeah that, but I, that was a really moving moment for me yeah just seeing the people that like i said yesterday you meet people you're like wow you're still you're still here i'm so thankful you're here wow i'm so thankful you're here so uh after that i went to the cafe so remember i told you that i went at nine but it says it's opened at 10 i went there at 10 it still wasn't open 
I wait till 10, 10, 10, 15, 10, 30, 10, 40, then 11 o'clock. I'm like, what is going on? And in my head, I'm just like, is this how it's done in the countryside? Right? And then I looked on the window and there's a handwritten letter. And basically the owner of the cafe is on vacation for two days. <laughs> So today and tomorrow, I will have no coffee. I have no coffee today and tomorrow, so uh, I need to find another place to get this. But I, I'm, I'm very, very thankful and hope I, I'll be able to, uh, I will be able to uh, uh, find some more good coffee places. And I did have a dilemma. I was like, oh my gosh, where do I get my coffee fixed today? But uh, like I said, I ended up meeting the, some leaders from the headquarters and we had lunch together. Uh, we had coffee. They brought me to a nice cafe too. And I, I, uh, this cafe is pretty good. It's on my Instagram, right? Uh, and uh, this coffee uh, wasn't that bad. It's a little bit do- uh, darker roast, which I personally don't prefer it, but it's still good coffee. And uh, I gave it like a 6.5. Yeah. And for me, that's, that's decent. 6.5 is decent. You know, in Rotten Tomatoes, as long as you get a 60%, it's something that's watchable. Right, so for me, it's a six point five, but the cafe was really nice, and they had a nice, huge outdoor space, and they have a patio. They have an upper deck and stuff like that too. So it was really, really nice. So even though the coffee six point, like for me, seven is something I'm. It's worth going back for. Like I'll go again and again and again if it's at least a seven. But it's a 6.5, but because of the interior and everything else, I'd still go back to there because the coffee was, it was, it was decent, right? Especially in this area, I'm in, I don't have very super high expectations, but it was nice. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Oh, one more time. I have another sneeze coming. Okay. Well, no, well, when it comes, it comes. So yeah, I was very satisfied and maybe it's because I didn't get my coffee in the morning that I was like kind of desperate for a coffee, but uh, it was good. And they, you know, the barista wasn't too bad. Like the... The way they're frothing the milk, the micro bubbles are really good. It was very creamy. I really liked it. And you had uh, some latte art there that was good too. Uh, today, we are going to go over uh, today. Like, so uh, just reminding you guys, uh, the word study we have from now on, well, for now, uh, the next series we're doing is not foundational books. We're going to talk about foundational figures in Christianity. So today I'm going to talk about one of the fathers of modern day Christianity. It is St. Augustine of Hippo, and he's considered one of the greatest thinkers in modern Christianity too. And he came in the year 800. Okay, so you're talking like 1,200 years ago, and this guy was very, very far ahead of his time. He wrote uh, Confessions, and he's the one that basically wrote like an autobiography uh, about how you go from, uh, how you're supposed to change from the world into Christianity, what are the steps that you take? And he answers a lot of those questions, and he, he does a lot of like apologetics, right? Explaining, uh, explaining, like questions people have about God, questions that people have about our sin, stuff like that too. So this is going to be a very, very good foundational figures also. All right. So yeah, I'm trying to think to myself if there's anything else I was going to think about besides, uh, oh, you know what? I and one, one thing is, guys, it's such a different feeling for me recording during the day or at night. Because I'm so used to doing it in the morning where that's, that's like the first thing that's on my mind. But I'm already, I've already hiked around Wollongong. I've already eaten food, had my coffee, talking with people, using a lot of energy, using a lot of my, 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 uh, uh, what do you call it? My, my key, my chi, right? And man, it is tough. Like last night was tough. And even right now, I'm a little bit tired. Not even a little bit. I'm tired, right? I, even though I had my coffee, you know, you spend a lot of energy talking to people. You spend a lot of energy thinking. And one thing on top of it is Korean is not my original language. It's not my first language. So when I speak in Korean, like so far while I'm here in uh, uh, in Korea, it's it's a big transition to change my language into Korean, right? And speaking only Korean. Like the the, the English I'm using most mostly right now is the English I'm using here for the podcast. So, yeah, I'm a bit tired. Uh, that's an understatement, too. I'm actually really tired. Like, even before I started this, I was kind of tired. But now that I'm into the podcast, I am actually uh, gaining a lot of strength talking to you guys. Uh, but overall, uh, I'm, I'm kind of tired. Kind of a lot. Kind of a lot tired, tired. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know even how else to say this. But I am quite excited because I will be having that welcoming party today. And you know what, guys? I forgot to tell you about what something else. Like, you know, I was telling you about how, how welcome I feel by God, like how God is working through people here. <laughs> One of the biggest signs I forgot to tell you 
was when I went to the Warbindung Cafe for the first time, uh, the person there knew me. I think, I don't know if I told you this, uh, got this already, but they gave me a free latte and that was very symbolic for me because that's the thing I'm like, oh, I'm here, you know, I, I love coffee and stuff like that. And I went to one window, very symbolic, the, the, the cafe for the first time. And uh, the, the worker there, and the, or it could be the owner there was just straight up like, oh, I haven't seen you in a long time. This latte is on me. So I did get a free latte. My first free coffee was here. So uh, I was inspired. Like, God, you really love me that you have given me the most favorite thing of mine. Uh, for free. And I was like, oh, I moved. I think tears might be coming out of my eyes. <laughs> Either way. All right. So uh, yeah, uh, that's uh, that's kind of like, these, these are a couple of things that I, I've been talking about, thinking about. But uh, let's get into, uh, before we get to the foundational figures um, uh, segment, let's get into the first break of the day. So let's get into today's word study. And every Wednesday, we were doing uh, the foundational books. And we just finished that section. We're going into foundational figures of Christianity. And today, we're going to go over St. Augustine of Hippo. He's one of the bishops. And he's like the first bishop to kind of start the... Uh, actually, no, I made a mistake. He's, he didn't come out in 800. It was 400. 800 was uh, Charlemagne, right? Uh, in the year 400 is when, uh, is the time, well, around the year 400 is when St. Augustine came into the picture. And, uh, you know, a lot of people consider him to be uh, probably the most significant Christian thinker after Paul, after Apostle Paul, right? And what Augustine does is he kind of like, he has, he adapts like classical thought to Christian teaching and he created like a theological system 
Uh, and this system uh, has a lot of power, lasting influence even until now. So you're talking 1,600 years of influence already. Uh, he has so many written works, and one of the ones I talked about is Confessions, which is probably one of the biggest ones. And um, he's the one that basically shaped uh, like apologetics or like explanation, like the exegesis, the explanation that helped lay the foundations for much of medieval and modern Christian thought. Right. So based even in the Roman Catholic Church, they kind of like call him the uh, the doctor of the church. Right. And he man, he is, you know, think about it. Someone who came in the year 400. It is remarkable that his work is still being used even today. He's someone that has been uh, that definitely was being used by God. Extraordinary works of writing that he did. And um uh, and they basically said that even if, even if none of his written works survived, he would still have been a major figure in Christianity, right? And, uh, you know, like, think about this. They consider him the most, like one of the most, uh, uh, what do you call it? The important or significant Christian thinkers after Apostle Paul. So that is saying that is something that's huge to, to say, say that about someone too, Right. So we're going to get into his story, and I hope you guys will really enjoy this. We're going to get into St. Augustine of Hippo, okay? So uh, his his real name is Aurelius Augustinus Hipponensis, right? And he's known as Augustine, right? He's born in Tagast, uh, and which is uh, present-day Algeria, which is like somewhere in North Africa. Oldest of three children, uh, and uh, he had a younger brother and a younger sister, his father, uh, his father wasn't wealthy, uh, but had civic responsibilities in his city, uh, which was part of the Roman Empire. Father was a pagan, and he was the father was known for his violent temper and immoral lifestyle. So, but it was Augustine's mother, right? And Augustine's mother is known today as Saint Monica struggled with alcohol at an early age, but overcame that vice. And she was raised a Christian and wholeheartedly embraced her Catholic faith. And despite suffering due to her husband's temper and adulterous behavior, St. Monica was a model of charity and her prayers eventually converted her whole family. Okay, so Augustine's father uh, would not permit his children to receive baptism despite, you know, their like their mother's pleas. But nevertheless, Monica ensured their, uh, you guys know what catechism is? Like they'll have look, those those seven things that they have to go through, right? In order for them to become uh, a full like Catholic and such. But Monica basically ensured that this catechetical formation uh, from an early age, right? Like all these, these values were put, were put into her children. Education in the classics and her faith instilled basically Augustine and awareness of Jesus, right? But interestingly, that awareness never fully like penetrated his young mind. Instead, Augustine was when he was young was a troublemaker, right? So we're talking about this one of the most famous people in Christianity. Listen to his story. Um, like they, he used to steal with his friends. At, at one point, there's a story that he stole some pears with his friends, not because they're hungry, uh, or because the pears were really like tasting really good. They only, he basically did it for the thrill of it, just stealing for the thrill of it, right? And he later talks about in his book Confessions that he says, "I loved my own undoing. I loved my error, not that for which I erred, but the error itself." seeking nothing from the shameful deed, but shame itself. It was a love of sin, All right? So that's what he said about his own life when he reflected back on it. Now, Augustine excelled in his studies in his hometown and his father, super proud of him, decided to send him to the thriving nearby city of Carthage to continue his education. Now, once he could find someone to pay, uh, but he needed someone he could find to pay for it or sponsor him, right? And this took several months. And Augustine's idleness during that time like, you know, so he's looking for someone to sponsor him to go to university, but he's got all this extra time. Basically, he got into more trouble. And his father died that year. Uh, and on top of it, like, um, finally, there's a wealthy citizen of Tagast uh, offered to sponsor Augustine's education. But by that time, uh, by the time he arrived in Carthage, like, basically, uh, Augustine was, like, super ripe in a life of sin. 
right? So even even many of the other students lived immorally, right? Like, and uh, for him, it was kind of the theaters that stirred up his passions, and he became very intoxicated by his literary success, right? He's a writer. So shortly after his arrival, he moved in with a young woman and fathered a child out of wedlock. So you know, back then, this is really bad, you know, frowned upon back then, but he had a child out of wedlock. He wasn't even married, right? And then what, and think about this, guys, before he's 19, okay? And then when he, when he was 19, uh, what happened was he read a book that changed his life. It was Cicero's Hortensius. That's the name of the book. Now, although that book is now lost to history, it extolled the virtue of wisdom. And when Augustine read that, it kind of awakened his hunger for truth. And he began to pursue wisdom earnestly. Now, of course, well, unfortunately, at this time, he started doubting his Christian faith. And that's because he had so much struggles with the Old Testament. And he, you know, he perceived the Old Testament as very violent and confusing. Uh, And then he kind of encountered uh, another religion or religious philosophy. uh, And it's called like Manichaeism. Manichaeism, something like that, right? And which claimed to have discovered secret knowledge and supported his view that the Bible had contradictions. Now, Manichaeism looked at reality as a struggle between light and dark, good and evil, and it regarded the created world as part of the dark side, aiming to trap us in darkness. So this kind, this new religion, Manichaeism, kind of really influenced him, and he looked into it a lot more. Now, he never formally joined, but he pursued their teachings in the hope of discovering the wisdom like that this Manichaeism was promising. Several years later, he would abandon them altogether, especially after meeting their leader, uh, was, his name was Faustus, who proved a disappointment and also less wise. So when Augustine completed his studies in Carthage around the age of 19, he returned home to Tagast with his girlfriend and son and began teaching grammar at a local school. So when he told his mother he was considering becoming a Manichaean, uh, she threw him out of her house, but later reconciled with him due to divine inspiration she received. Now, he was so successful as a teacher that he was invited back to Carthage a few years later to teach rhetoric. Now, after several successful years, he received an invitation to Rome, which was a great honor. And when he informed his mother, she told him that she was going with him, to which he kind of reluctantly agreed. Now, Augustine tricked his mother, left for Rome without her. And in Rome, he became disgusted with the students who cheated him out of tuition fees. And after a few years, accepted a position in Milan. Now, it was in Milan when Augustine was 30 years old that his mother finally caught up with him and witnessed his conversion. So this is kind of crazy. At 30 years old, that's the same time when Jesus came out, right, for his mission. So still searching for truth at 30, Augustine met the future saint. His name was Bishop Ambrose of Milan, very, very famous. Ambrose was a great thinker and preacher, and he also paid attention to Augustine, listening to him, offering him friendship, and answering his many questions. Ambrose introduced him to the proper reading of the Bible, especially helping him with his difficulties with the Old Testament. Now, when Ambrose came into conflict with the Empress Justina, who was trying to take his cathedral and make it Arian, Ambrose stood his ground in an act of great courage and defiance, and she backed off, and Augustine was greatly impressed. So one day while sitting in the garden, Augustine heard a child's voice say to him, just out of nowhere, it's, take and read. Now, he didn't. He had no idea where the voice was coming from. But next to him was a Bible. So he picked it up and randomly opened up to Romans chapter 13, verse 13 and 14, which read, Let us conduct ourselves properly as in the day, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in promiscuity and uh, licentiousness, not in rivalry and jealousy but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the flesh. And when he read that verse, Augustine was affected so deeply that he began his conversion like in haste, right? So he started spending time with his good Catholic friends, had lengthy conversations, which helped him like immensely. His mother's presence was also a great support. And, all, and although she was uneducated, her wisdom and insight into the truth was undeniable. She always held her own with her well-educated son. And all of this coupled with uh, 
His mother's tearful prayers led the 32-year-old Augustine toward his final conversion and baptism the following year by Bishop Ambrose during the Easter Vigil in 387. Now, once ba- and his, all, his son was baptized too at the same time. But once he was baptized, Augustine decided to return to his hometown with his mother, with his son and his friends. Now, on the way home, his mother fell ill just outside of Rome and died. Augustine later recounted her passing in the confessions, uh, the books that he wrote, which is one of the most beautiful depictions of a mother and son's love ever written. Now, upon returning to Tagast, Augustine formed a religious community with his friends, and his reputation within the Christian community grew quickly, and their hometown genius, who'd become a Catholic, became a source of hope for many. So by acclamation of the people, he became a priest in 391 and was consecrated as bishop of the nearby town of Hippo in 396. And during his 43 years as a Christian, Augustine became one of the greatest if not the greatest theologians in the history of the church. His pastoral work with the people, his sermons, and his attentiveness to the people's needs changed lives. Augustine's, he's got so many writings that still remain today among the most read and quoted texts. Like even today, his works include apologetics, sermons, letters, scripture commentaries, uh, monastic rule of philosophical, theological uh, writings. But his greatest work we talked about before in the in the foundational books of Christianity is Confessions, an autobiographical, deeply personal and, hum- uh, and humble book he wrote about himself. And it traces its internal conversion and, uh, like, and how he changes and converts over to Christianity, right? Or to Catholicism. Uh, he also has another great work called City of God, and he defends the faith and refutes the ad- idea that the sack of Rome in 410 was caused by a rejection of pagan gods. So instead, he compares the city of man with the city of God, pointing society to the ideals to which it is called. And he also wrote a famous work on the Trinity, right? Among numerous other works. So in total, over 5 million words written by Augustine have survived until today, numbering over 1,000 documents in his last year of life. So he witnessed the destruction of Hippo as the barbarians invaded, um, murdered, destroyed churches and buildings, and overthrew the town as they had done in Rome years earlier. And uh, they, but However, they could not destroy uh, the lasting impact that Augustine would have on the people. So his influence extends far beyond the church, and he has profoundly impacted the entirety of Western thought. So it's it's something where we people look at him as this, or honor St. Augustine as someone with a pillar of wisdom, and consider uh, especially Augustine's personal journey towards Christ in many ways, right? that uh, Augustine lived two different lives. At first, he was weak, confused, a sinful man. And then the second life he lived was, uh, became a sinner who was redeemed and transformed by grace. And his struggle led him to the truth. And when that happened, God used him in extraordinary ways. And his life can be summed up in one of his most famous quotes. Uh, Augustine said, Our hearts were made for you, O Lord, and they are restless until they rest in you. So uh, uh, a lot of people and a lot of theologians will say that when you read his writings, when you read uh, what he talks about, uh, you will ponder your own story of conversion and you will also think about the ways that you were restless before you came to Christ, right? So it's very, very amazing. This uh, St. Augustine's example uh, of seeking the truth with all of his heart, knowing that God will reveal himself to you, re- reveal himself to whoever when they are ready so that we will be able to rest in him. So uh, I would I will leave this uh, final quote from uh, St. Augustine's book, Confessions. And he says, uh, St. Augustine, you were a sinner who was redeemed by Christ. You then devoted your whole life to the glory of God and the salvation of souls. Please pray for me that I will discover what you discovered and imitate your radical conversion, holding nothing back from our merciful God, St. Augustine of Hippo. Pray for me, Jesus, I trust in you. 
right? So it's uh, it's 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 really really amazing. He is one of the fathers of modern day Christianity, and he came what the year four hundred guys. He is the first bishop to start the uh the the time of uh you know um when you look at the the history lesson, there is a time of judges which is compared at the exact same time as the time of bishops to end. Saint Augustine is the first to go into uh, first to be the first bishop to be in that realm, right into that time period. All right, uh, so very very interesting. I hope you guys look into him. There's probably gonna be a lot of stuff on YouTube where you can listen to his story and such also. Uh, but yeah, his story is amazing. Think about it. He even like if you think about it in our terms, he committed the fall. He didn't get married. He committed the fall with a woman, had a child, and then he converted and became this amazing person that has affected Christianity for the last 1600 years. So that is today's foundational figure. That is St. Augustine of Hippo. All right, so uh, then let's get into our second break of the day.
Okay, so let's get into our final segment for today. And every Wednesday, we have Health is Happiness. We have a lot of amazing people in the medical health professions. And uh, last week, we did... Um, the, the liver, and that was by Dr. Abe over there in Australia. And today we'll finish it off with part two of the liver. And next week we will have some brand new episodes coming out too from Yin Yu once again, uh, starting to be a physical therapist. So I can't wait for those also. So first uh, today, let's finish off today's uh, episodes on the liver. This is part two with Dr. Abe from Australia. Hi everyone, it's Abe here, doctor in Melbourne, Australia, and we are back after a short hiatus with our organ series. Last time we spoke about the liver, so let's now continue our discussion. Now when it comes to diseases of the liver, I like to think them in five categories. The first is infections. Now these are the hepatitis viruses. There's five of them and they go from A to E. You can get them from either exposure to an already infected person's blood, by eating contaminated food or water, but particularly in ice, or through sexual contact. Thankfully, we actually do have vaccines for most of them, and for the ones that we don't, there are very good antivirus treatments available. Moving on, the second category is substances. So these include medications, and the big one is alcohol. So, lots of medications um, as a side effect can affect the liver. And that makes sense, right? Because remember last time we talked about how the liver processes toxins from our bloodstream. Now, the way it works is medications often have an active ingredient. And that specific ingredient is what helps us with the medical condition that we have. Unfortunately, sometimes, however, those medications have toxic byproducts. And those are the things that can affect the liver. Now, just to be clear, it's not all medications, and when used in safe and correct doses that your doctors have prescribed you, they won't actually affect your liver. But if, for example, you overdose, and the most common medication that is overdosed is paracetamol in this, exa in this context, then that can harm your liver in a lot of ways. The other substance is alcohol, which is also processed by the liver. So excess alcohol can actually lead to what's known as cirrhosis. So let's discuss cirrhosis in a little bit more detail as an aside. So cirrhosis is specifically when the liver becomes scarred and roughened. And this is essentially due to a long-standing repeated toxin buildup, of which alcohol is one. So moving into this a little bit further, it's actually a progressive problem that happens over you know a lot of, a lot of years, essentially. So the liver inherently is actually very good at healing itself. It has a really big regenerative capacity. However, in cirrhosis, the liver is exposed to a toxin. That toxin causes inflammation of the liver. The liver then tries to heal itself. But if the toxin is still present, then the healing can't keep up. So eventually, the liver cells die and they're replaced by scarred and fibrotic tissue. If the toxin still isn't replaced, then this cycle just continues and continues and continues. So eventually, most of the healthy liver cells die out and they are replaced by that non-functioning scar tissue. And that's why uh, the liver is very th rough and thickened. Okay, let's move on to the third category. Now, there are actually non-alcoholic causes of cirrhosis, and that leads me to the third category, which is called fatty liver disease. Now, this fatty liver disease essentially relates to what's known as the metabolic syndrome. Okay, and the metabolic syndrome um, contains things like obesity, high cholesterol, diabetes, and high blood pressure. All these concurrent medical conditions are a cesspool for liver disease. Because what happens is, is with obesity and high levels of cholesterol, the liver actually develops pockets of fat within itself. And that's again very toxic and causes inflammation of the liver. And the cycle of healing and insult and healing and insult of the liver starts again like we spoke about and eventually leads to cirrhosis. Okay, the fourth category is known as autoimmune disease, and that essentially means where the body attacks itself. And there's also a component of genetic diseases, such as hemochromatosis, which essentially means too high iron levels in the blood, or Wilson's disease, which essentially means too high copper levels in the blood. Once again, too much of anything is toxic to the liver. Now, finally, our fifth category is cancer. 
Uh, one of the most common cancers of the liver is called hepatocellular carcinoma. I come to it last because essentially any of the disease categories we spoke about can eventually lead to cancer. If there's a lot of inflammation, a lot of scarring of the liver, they can predispose the healthy liver cells to undergo mutations. And with any mutations in the genetic code, it's, your, your liver is very susceptible to developing cancer after that. Okay. Now, in terms of the symptoms, there are many symptoms and signs that might indicate that you have an issue with your liver. The most well-known one is jaundice. Now, jaundice is the yellowing of your skin and eyes, and it actually occurs due to a chemical called bilirubin, which accumulates in your blood. Now, it's actually a normal product of our body, and it gets processed in the liver and then removed from our body in either our urine or stool. But if you have liver disease, well, that means your liver can no longer process that bilirubin, and so it accumulates in our blood. And once it reaches certain levels, that's why uh, the yellow tingling starts to appear in our skin and eyes. Other symptoms also include itchiness of the skin. You may also notice pale stools or darker urine. You obviously might develop some abdominal pain, particularly on the right-hand side because that's where the liver sits. And associated with this, you might have some nausea and some vomits. Now, those are sort of general signs and symptoms that something might be wrong with the health of your liver. But moving forward from that is that, that your liver can actually go into failure. And it's important to know some of the signs and symptoms here because, of course, it's a medical emergency. Now, all of the above diseases that we spoke about can cause this. And some of the biggest signs to look out for is what's known as hepatic encephalopathy. So hepatic is just another way of saying liver. And encephalopathy is just a fancy way of saying any disorder that is affecting the brain. So it's basically saying a liver-causing brain dysfunction. And often patients present with confusion. They might go into a coma. They're very unsteady on their feet, they're not thinking straight. So that's the first symptom of liver failure. The next is called ascites. Now what this is essentially is fluid accumulation in the stomach. And so often patients will come in with very, very distended stomachs. Uh, and that's a sign that potentially that the liver is failing. And one of the other major signs and symptoms of liver failure is bleeding and bruising. Now, we mentioned that the liver has a very important role in producing the clotting proteins. And if there's a deficiency in it, then obviously, if you can imagine that you have a cut, if there's no clotting proteins in the, in the bloodstream, you'll continue to bleed. So thanks, everyone, for listening in. Uh, hopefully, you've learned a little bit about liver diseases. I uh, look forward to seeing you guys in the next one. And thank you so much, Dr. Abe, for another wonderful episode of Health is Happiness. This is a rerun going over the liver, and we have just finished part two of two. And I hope you guys really, really enjoyed that. If you have any other questions about health, please uh, send them to the email. So you'll find the email in the description below if you have any questions about health, and the doctors will help you with that too. Okay? So there it is, guys. That is the end of today's Wednesday podcast. Hope you guys super enjoyed it as much as I have. Have an amazing, awesome service tonight. And we'll see you guys again tomorrow on the Morning Star Drive on 117.8. It's the morning star drive, 117.8. You soaring up with sky, now's the time, don't delay. I'm sitting in my ride, and it's time to fly. So let's realign, just listen and fill your mind. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm like this. I got my head in the zone, you know. I'm on the morning star drive, you know. I'm burning with desire and the passion. Nobody can stop me when I'm